because it's made out of rectangles. <laughs> And before I jump into talking about all of the different dresses, um, even though I'm not going to be talking about much of the male costumes because I know nothing about 18th century men's fashions except basically how to identify if something's from the 18th century, um, there is one men's fashion choice in the show that is very representative of a theme throughout the entire show and the costumery as well. And it's the fact that it's called Great, an occasionally true story, rather than just the great. Um, and this means that things are definitely, history is definitely messed with and things are definitely not completely accurate. And it kind of gives almost, it feels like the costumes, a slight excuse to be not completely period accurate. And so, Basically, the first thing I wanted to talk about is the jogging suits that we see Leo and Peter wear. So from what I can tell, and obviously you can't always tell a fabric from touching it, but it seems like they're both like very loose linen almost weaves um, that are making up these drawstring jogging suits that, um, that these two characters wear. And it's very, very, um, even though like the concept of them is very, very inaccurate and obviously drawstrings didn't exist at the time and well, they did, but you know, stretch didn't really exist at the time. The fact that they're made out of linen as a, like just very slight realm of authenticity because linen is probably one of the most breathable fabrics you can wear. Um, much more breathable than, breathable than cotton and wood. And then also these clothes are made how you would probably make a jogging suit if you were making one in the 18th century because it's made out of rectangles. <laughs> um, if you're familiar with 18th century fashion, you might know what I'm talking about. If not, it's fine um, because Basically, men's shirts in the 18th century were comprised out of a couple rectangles. Rectangle for the top part, and then rectangles for the sleeves, and then the sleeves are kind of gathered here and occasionally sometimes gathered at the shoulders, blah, 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 blah. They were made out of rectangles. <laughs> um, and so even though these have hoods added onto them, you can tell that they're constructed in the same way that 18th century men's shirts are by the way that the seams and these, um, the way that the seams and basically the, the suits are just hanging in general. The other detail I really like is the um, two or maybe three like metal buttons at one of the sides. It's, it's probably not historically <laughs> accurate um, considering we're talking about a jogging suit, but it's also not, it's also very evocative of a kind of militaristic twist that ex that was very, very common in some 18th century clothing that wouldn't be considered militaristic. And so it's just a nice little detail. And it just, the costume really, really sums up the whole thesis of the show. <laughs> it's 18th century in a lot of different ways, but it fudges with the actual history of the situation. Um, and then, so next we must talk about Mariel's costumes because they are wonderful. She is wearing a, what seems to be a shift with a pair of stays over, a couple petticoats, maybe some hip padding, a um, couple things, occasionally an apron, occasionally a headdress. Um, and this is reasonably um, accurate. I couldn't find any reference to what serfs in particular were wearing in around the 1760s, which is when I'm postulating the show is taking place. Um, <laughs> and 
So it makes sense for it to be in the 1760s based off the various dates as the whole coup thing happened in, I think, 1763. And um, despite Peter and Catherine being married like 30 years earlier, because we got to figure out, I think it's the clothing just seems to feel very 1863. And so one of the things I really like about this costume in particular is it's taking a concept of working women's wear from the time and it's elevating it to a servant or serf actually. Um, indentured servitude is not a good thing. Um, <laughs> a serf, um, it's an elevating it to a serf who'd work in a castle around very wealthy people who probably would not want their servants to be dressed like servants. <laughs> So they would have, um, so it's basically taking this concept of what would be 18th century peasant wear, or 18th century working woman's wear, and they're adding in these much more expensive and luxury fabrics that make it look very gorgeous while still maintaining that peasant look. Um, you have brocades and silks used for the covered stays that she wears with spiral lacing, which is wonderful because a lot of people don't use spiral lacing. The stays have stomacher, it is like a stomacher. It's a very wide stay, which implies that the stays are not super recent, but I mean, she's a surf, even though she wasn't a surf, she is now a surf. And you're not gonna have access to the newest clothes, particularly with these garments. Um, and then the other thing is that these petticoats are made of incredibly gorgeous brocades, brocades and other fabrics of the light, of the sort. So they very much look wealthy while still looking peasanty, um, which I just, I think is a wonderful, wonderful detail. Also, Muriel's, um, Muriel's um, shift that you can see the sleeves of are showing up. It's very, very made from rectangles, as I'm saying before. <laughs> um, and then the one other element I thought was interesting is the head coverings of the serfs. Now, I believe this has something to do with traditional Russian dress, which has a very complex history. Um, after the Tsardom was, of Russia was founded mid-16th century, um, everyone kind of stuck to this Slavic origin clothes um, and traditional dress of Russia's areas, Russia's domain, um, partially because of heavy influence from a conservative church. And then around the very, very end of the 17th century, beginning of the 18th century, Peter the Great rose to power and decided that he wanted to modernize Russia in a very Eurocentric concept. So one of the aspects that he did was making Russia look more um, Western, more European. And he did that through mandating that all people shall wear now, shall wear um, German dress rather than traditional Russian dress. And so from what I can tell, the complete accuracy of how people adhered to that um, basically is very, very vague. There's reports of Catherine the Great wearing a lot of Russian traditional dress, um, I think in the 1780s, I guess. There's reports of people who came post, who came like in the 17, even 40s, where people weren't adhering to this. Um, and then there's a lot about how also they were definitely not up to date on fashion. But um, one of the things that really I find interesting about Muriel wearing a headdress is it seems to be one of these very referential to a more traditional Russian dress. So I could not find exact relation of this headdress. Um, I did a lot of research. Um, the closest I could get is it seems to be referencing um, a, hold on, let me see if I can get this, Pavinky or Pavinky. I don't know how to say that um, because it's less 
Russian. It for some reason does not read Russian in my head, so. Um, pull Vinky, um, or something like that. Um, I'll put the word up because I just, well, I wanna know how it's. Okay, I cannot find where I got this idea from. I seriously cannot find a reference to it that's not written in Russian and seeing as I cannot read a Cyrillic alphabet, um, we will never know how it's pronounced, it seems. Um, basically, Muriel's costume, I think, has a very nice reference to the fact that there still are roots of Russian dress, even though Peter the Great apparently went you know, forced everyone to shift their entire clothing style over the course of 10 years into Western, more modern dress. Um, and so moving on, we can talk very quickly about the stays that we see wearing. Both of the times we see stays like that are not Mariel stays, which are used more as a bodice, which is completely acceptable for a working woman. Um, we see instead, um, Catherine and George, Georgina, um, wearing stays that are very, very 1760s. They have this kind of V-style boning pattern in the front. Um, they both are strapless, um, and they are made of a brocade. They're gorgeous. They look like noble women stays. Um, and they are not worn for the sake of show, they're not shown for the sake of proving the dangers of corsetry because, yeah, corsets weren't dangerous. They are worn the same reason that bras are, and I personally believe that bras are a lot more detrimental to health. But, um, you know, you move on from that. Um, what also what I like is that you see them wearing shifts underneath their stays because no one wore corsets on bare skin. That would be unhygienic. That would be insane because you'd just be trapping any bodily odors on this very hard to wash thing. So yeah, that's nice. And it looks like these, um, these shifts are made out of rectangles, which I find very, very pleasing because rectangles they're important to 18th century fashion um then we can go into talking about the various day dresses that Catherine wears the first one i want to talk about is this light blue robe a la anglaise that she wears quite often throughout the series i love when we see even rich people sorry my chair's all creaky um i love when we see you know very wealthy people even um still wearing repeat clothing because silk takes a lot to manufacture it's very hard to find widths of silk you're not going to be able to get like 300 silk dresses that's just not possible based off the um availability of silk at the time so um you see you're wearing like a silk robe blue robe robe and gloss this one um a lot and it's really really a good um idea of 18th century fashion um for a post for the second half of the 18th century pre-transitional period post stomacher period um where a lot of dresses started to close just in a line down the front rather than having a stomacher um i don't know if you can see it but the dress to my left has a thing called a compier, which is a basically a stomacher that's been altered so it's more fashionable and opens in the center rather than opening to one side or another. Um, and since this dress is cut this way, um, it has a very, very accurate silhouette. It's very conical and then it has this kind of rounded thing that's accurate for Catherine's part of the 18th century, as well as her personal style. She's dressed in a lot of pastels, light, cool colors, and it's really, really gorgeous. Um, and one of the things I also really like about this dress is that there's minimal trim on it. There's still trim. It's still 18th century. It's not, you know, the end of the world, but there's minimal trim, which really keeps up with the Catherine's very simple dress. Um, another dress I really wanted to talk about, um, that's 
very different from her other day dresses is the green dress she wears when she goes with Anne Elizabeth to um, see the war front. Um, because there's something very, very clever done with the costuming here where it looks like it was, it's a old robe à la Francoise or robe, robe, robe la Anglaise, um, that has been altered to have a different silhouette, the more rounded silhouette rather than the wider silhouette, um, for her. And I really, really like this as a detail because it does truly, truly seem, um, like a thing that you'd wear to the war front because it's muddy, it's bloody, it's not a fun time, honestly, going to the war front. So having something with a stomacher that's basically been worn, that's basically been altered for, you know, think for day wear, but day wear that you're a little bit more worried about the preservation of your wonderful fabrics. It's a really, really good detail just because it's so distinctly different from a lot of the other dresses Catherine wears. And it really does seem like that was the intention. Also in this scene, she was wearing a fichu because she is outside. That was how people protected themselves from the sun. And because she was around a lot of people for modesty's sake. Um, and then finally, the other day dress of Catherine's I really wanted to talk about is this lime green. Um, it's this lime green dress um, and it's very, very strange. It seems like it's more of a bodice and skirt combo rather than a full, um, rather than a full, like, dress robe a la blah or Italian gown or whatever you want to call various dresses. Um, because you can see its front is completely smooth. There seems to be a visible busk and visible boning through the fabric. It's a little bit wrinkled. You can't avoid some fabric wrinkling. I've spent hours like re-sewing my lining onto this to try to avoid some wrinkling. It's very, very hard. Um, and yeah, it's just because of the way the front is, it means it's laced up in the back. And because it's laced up in the back, that would very, very few 18th century dresses actually did that. So it's a little bit bizarre. This is not completely historically accurate, but it has the elements of historical construction, historical silhouette, and various other things. The construction is a little bit off, but it still has bias cut front panels that are very smooth over a conical silhouette with um, a rounded skirt of the time and usually three quarter sleeves. Perfectly, perfectly acceptable for the time. Um, then the other things, are these wonderful, wonderful shirts, dress things, um, which is kind of her less formal day wear of what looks like to be a men's shirt, a men's style rectangle shirt, because it's made with rectangles because it's the 18th century, and um, with a skirt with probably a bum roll kind of style of padding around it and a belt. And like, one of the things I really, really like about this is it's such a unique take of various 18th century garments. You're taking a men's shirt, you're putting a skirt on it. It looks, it very much seems like a fashion move that someone would make probably 10 years ago now and call it revolutionary. But it's a very, very like interesting way to take um, 18th century clothing and to do something new with it. The other thing is some outerwear. We see various coats and cloaks and things. They maintain the right silhouette. They maintain a really reasonable construction. Um, and particularly, there is a riding coat. There are multiple riding coats, various iterations of riding coats that we see. Um, we see one on George that's like, I think, green um, riding coat that is very, very directly inspired by the military. And then we see a very different version of a redding coat, which is a um, blue silk one that we see on Catherine that is basically um, verbatim, whatever that means um, in the terms of clothing, of a um, silhouette that, of a coat that you can see at the um, Met, but with different fabrics. And that is such a common coat. You can find like, patterns for it. I think there's a pattern in um, Nora Wag's kind of woman's fashion. And um, 
it's just it's an all-around great um choice so next thing pink dress from the final final episode i'm not debating whether or not this color could be made from natural dyes i personally believe it could i'm actually thinking about doing a test and experiment to see if it could be done um but my biggest problem with it is she cuts open the dress to expose her stomach she has been wearing stays the entire show. It's very clear from the conical silhouette. It's very clear by the position of her breast. It's very clear that she's wearing stays. And then she cuts open her stomach to reveal there's no stays. We've seen her wearing fully bound stays. She should have had to cut through like, hmm, like maybe 40 or 50 whalebone channels to expose that much stomach, honestly. And clearly she did not do that with a letter opener. So I have nothing to say really about this dress. It's gorgeous. You can actually see the way that the shift has kind of peeked out in one of the scenes and all of that stuff. But where are the stays? Why aren't they where they should be? They're just not there. And that is weird, um, particularly because she still has a conical silhouette. That is false 18th century fashion advertising. That is not how you achieve that silhouette. There is a corset happening there. It's giving you false body expectations. Um, and so it's just, it's not a good, it's just something that really puzzled me and kind of pulled me out of the show. But yeah, I don't fully know the explanation for that. It seems like they probably did short stays or something. They made two dresses and did one with the rip or something like that. Um, and the one without the rip had um, the corsetry in it or something like that. I don't know. Um, but it's just, it's it's a strange um, thing. I think probably if it's the costume designer had an issue because it was a plot point in the script and then they had to work around it. But, you know, things happen. Okay, and then finally... We will talk quickly about the two court dresses that we see. One is the blue court dress with um, a trim that's blue and then the sheer silk chiffon sleeves. Um, love this. Court dresses of the 18th century were worn because um, mostly robe a la Francoise, robe a la Anglaise, all those open robe and like Mantua style dresses were not seen as being suitable for um, court because they're kind of informal if you think about them. They're basically just a coat thrown over your stays with and your skirt. It's, it's not a particularly formal thing. So they stuck to a 16th century fashion style of wearing um, boned bodices that can lace up in the back with a wide neckline and then skirts with and the skirts would change shape based off what shape was fashionable but the bodice style just remained um and you see that in this blue dress the one thing I'd have a issue with is it's not super decorated um when you look at various um portraiture you see these really really decorated dresses but that goes to talking about um, Catherine's character, how she dresses in general, and the fact that she probably would not be wearing a super, you know, decorated dress based off her character. Um, the other thing I like is I really love the share sleeves. It both looks modern, but also does evoke a lot of 18th century court portraiture, um, which I really, really love because you can see those kinds of sleeves on various court portraiture and things like that. And it's quite quite pretty um and then the other court dress we see is the wedding dress which when I first saw it thought it was completely inaccurate um other than the silhouette I thought it was completely inaccurate and then I realized a okay it's a court dress because it's a wedding dress that's fine and then b the cap sleeves were really throwing me off um until I was looking through various things and saw um saw Queen Alexandra of Sweden's coronation gown. I don't know if it's Alexandra. It was from about 
1750 something and it's basically very very similar to the same neckline same sleeves same like embroidery style the only difference is it's a more rounded um catherine's is a more rounded so what why that has massive paneers on it um very grand paneers um so i think it's such a gorgeous dress i think it's such a gorgeous use of showing the variety of 18th century fashion the fact that it isn't just you know this very strict line and i think really overall if you look at the um clothes from this there's some inaccuracies there's some latent inaccuracies that can glare out there's the issues with some of the dress bodices and why some of the dresses were made the way they are and the case of the missing stays which is clearly the biggest problem but um I think the costume designer did a really really great job in making 18th century clothes look both attractive in the ways that they were you know considered historically and being really beautiful but also catering towards a modern eye and it's not about in my opinion basically people not being seen as able to appreciate various styles like if you watch gentleman jack or something like that i love the costumes and i love the 18 1830s um full sleeve full puffy sleeves and the crazy hair and all that stuff it's such a look that looks so right and is so gorgeous in a very weird way from you know modern conception but watching that doesn't obscure you and i feel like when you choose to make costumery you know deviate more historically than you know what you know people on the internet mostly would just say is kind of poppy wash or whatever um and say oh it's just inaccurate and then move on um it's not always inaccurate because it's not the standards of modern beauty but it's just the standards of being able to show variety through colors through um through colors through different fabrics through various things to be able to show personality and stuff like that where there's a lot of excellent garments out there with variety of styles nothing's really the same except for the silhouette and some of the construction methods and that's really what accuracy has to come down to is was it made out of the right fabric for the time? Was it, does it have the right silhouette? Does it have the right construction methods? And the right undergarments. And most of these dresses do fit like two out of three of those categories. And I think that's actually a pretty good job considering how bleak sometimes 18th century costumery can be done um, recently. Um, because people either skew the idea of 18th century costuming because Emma Watson won't wear stays because it's anti-feminist and then you end up with some really weird dresses. We have been reusing a lot of 18th century costumes at this point. Costumes that were used in um, Belle are used in Harlot. Costumes that are used in The Duchess are used in Harlots and Belle and all those different things. Um, so reusing of costumes has kind of made it so there's less um, interesting and fun variety going on in the 18th century. I think since most of these garments from what I can tell seem to be originally made for the show, it's a really, really, I think, nice and kind of refreshing and to see refreshing 18th century thing that's very, very new and beautiful.